Afternoon, ladies and gents. Uh, Simon Brown here doing today's presentation, looking at the trade walls which are currently running like crazy, uh, talking around those and what we can do about them. And I'm going to go all the way back in time uh, to Smoot Hawley from the 1930s. Smoot Hawley were two congressmen in America. Uh, and they started a tariff, uh, a set of tariffs. It was supposed to be initially just uh, on two agricultural products. And there were a couple of others added. And by the time they got the process finished and passed through Congress in 1930, uh, we had over 6,000 items on that list. And it was really with the industrialization trying to protect farmers and the like. Um, but it certainly didn't help the, the crisis of the 1930s. Uh, it didn't cause it, but it wasn't a help there. And it, it caused some, some, some panics and that this you know, two congressmen and, and, and a lot of special interests went into it. You know, Congress people would go back to their districts and the, the farmers would say, hey, we farm whatever, we want our slice as well. Uh, and it got it just got messy. And as I said, spiraled from literally two products to ultimately over 6,000 products. And as a totally useless random factoid of the day, uh, featured in Ferris Bueller's day off uh, in the one scene. But what happened post this was that Congress got a fright and thought to themselves, hang on, this gets out of control, too many special interests. You know what we need to do? We need to give tariffs to the president. So now we have a situation in the U.S. where tariffs are the sole discretion of the president of the United States of America. Um, there are processes and the last round of tariffs uh, announced onto China are still only due to come into impact next week because there's processes that needs to be followed. But the president has full authority to impose any tariff on anyone against anything, whatever they want. Full authority. Uh, Congress no longer has that. Just the point on, in terms of of, of trade negotiations um, and 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 trade deals and the like, negotiated by typically the president and the team, but then signed off by Congress. So you know, trade deals different from trade tariffs. The president of the United States does have that full power to implement whatever tariffs they want. They basically sign a dock and they are off to the races. So that's how come we are where we are right now with President Trump, Trump imposing all sorts of, of, of tariffs and threats and the like uh, across. But let's delve into some of those details, what exactly is happening. Um, so tariffs in of themselves, essentially they're a, a, a customs charge and they're charged at that port of entry. Uh, the money charged goes to National Treasury. But for example, if you're sitting in America and you're importing something that has a tariff on it and you're paying $100 uh, and there's a 25% tariff, uh, customs will charge you a $25 tariff on it. That money then goes into National Treasury. In this case, obviously the US coffers um, and business goes on. Of course, it increases that cost to the importer. They paid what instead of paying a hundred dollars for whatever that widget was, they now effectively pay a hundred and twenty five dollars. Now, if you're bringing in a full product that is completely ready to be sold, that twenty five dollars gets passed straight on. If you're bringing in aluminum or something like that, you know something which is like a part of a product, it'll only get partly passed on. But in essence, these tariffs are by and large passed on to the end user, to the consumer at the end of the day. Now, we can get some substitution. I'm going to touch on that in a moment, but pretty much most of them are passing through. What we have seen on the tariffs that currently exist between China and the US is they're not directly on consumer products. You know, it's, it's a bunch of things that are being used in the manufacturing of consumer products, um, but this new round will directly hit products that are being purchased by uh, Americans. I was uh, reading some stuff this morning around companies who are sort of getting ready for the Christmas sales and, and things like Christmas hats and tinsel and all of that sort of stuff and, and toys and the like. And they're struggling. They're struggling because they don't want the 25% that's going to be slapped on top by the time they get their orders in. But also they're struggling to find alternative products that are competitively priced. Given time, you can. And I'm going to go down that road as well. But at this point, not. Um, the question then comes in, well, what, where's the World Trade Organization in this? I mean, the World Trade Organization mostly has authority over trade deals, but it also has authority over tariffs uh, as being completely and absolutely quiet. And the bigger issue, perhaps, 
with with the, the World Trade Organization is simply that they are at this point in their process just not being efficient whatsoever. Um, David, you're asking determining tariffs for composite items that do not fit directly into list materials becomes very complicated. It, it absolutely is, and I, I'll touch on some of it in a moment. But you know, it, it if you're if you're importing, uh, let me take a random example. You're importing, I don't know, bananas from from China, and suddenly there's a tariff slapped onto it. Well, maybe you can get bananas from Brazil, and maybe those Brazilian bananas are are, are of of uh, uh, comparable quality and comparable price. But if you're Foxconn or something and you're making parts of bits and pieces, it gets a lot harder. Global supply chains are immense. And you know, I was looking at motor car manufacturing in, in, in America, between America and Mexico. And some of those cars or parts of the cars are crossing that border 15, 20, 25 times. It will continue. Um, so let's look at particular in China. At the moment, it's mostly tariffs of, of around 10%, but the new ones will kick in uh, at 25%. Um, at the moment, that 10% applies to about a 250 billion, about a quarter of a trillion of, of goods uh, coming into the US um, and another 300 billion coming late June at 25%. That's the most recent uh, uh, round announced by Trump. This is, and, and the, the, the most accurate data I could find was out of a total of 500 billion and those numbers don't add up because that 500 billion is a 2017 number. Um, and in fact, we saw some increases during 2018. But broadly, what we're going to start to see is that pretty much all products coming from China will be subject to tariffs uh, of between 10 and 25 percent at this point in the process. Uh, Chinese tariffs for U.S. goods are sitting on goods of about 110 billion out of a total of 130. That 130 billion is a 2017 annual number has also creeped up. But what we can patently see is that the U.S. with these new tariffs are going full hilt um, and that China is very close to going full hilt. What we are seeing with interest that China is lowering some tariffs with other trading partners um, to try and create some more trade in those particular spaces. So there is some shake happening down there. But at this point, when these latest round of tariffs go into effect, what we're going to be seeing is pretty much all, all goods between the US and China will be subject to one or another tariff, make no mistake about it. Europe is on the list, uh, but the talks there ongoing, it's only eight and a half billion pounds. Um, it's not at this point in time significant or important. Important. And we can largely park Europe and say that this, these trade wars at this point in time very much are between the US and China. And the problem with that is quite simple, aside from the obvious, those are the two biggest economies in the world. If the trade war was US and, and, and South Africa, I, we wouldn't be happy. Let's say the US and Zimbabwe, it, no one would notice because Zimbabwe, their economy doesn't matter. This is the two largest economies. That's the point. Quickly touch on Mexico. When I was initially putting this together, there were threats around Mexico, uh, Mexican trade, uh, terrorists, uh, uh, and, 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 and Trump was using it very much as a case of fix the border or else. And it, it's mixing processes, for want of a, of, of a kindest phrase I can think of. But you know, that's his style, and that's how he does it, and it's usually on the Twitters. Um, he then announced uh, that, that they had reached an agreement. Uh, by all accounts, it seems to have actually been an agreement that was announced back, or that was agreed to back in March, is being implemented. He says there's a secret part of the agreement um, that is still to come into place at this point. We, we don't know what, if at all, that secret part is. Interestingly, there is the old NAFTA, which came in North Atlantic Free, Free Trade Allowance from the early 90s, being replaced by United States, Mexico, Canada agreement. Um, that has not yet been signed by Congress, and it is broadly pretty much the same as NAFTA. But what we, what we have in the situation with Mexico is that we're back to trade peace. But what it also tells us is that President Trump is more than happy to use tariffs as a as a stick to get other things done. You know, so maybe he decides that I don't know he wants to he wants Table Mountain and therefore give him the mountain, or or he will put tariffs on us. Now, I know that sounds completely ludicrous, but in essence, he's not saying, well, if you're doing tariffs, I do tariffs. He's he's linking different issues together and he's using tariffs as his large stick. And that the the biggest 
trick perhaps, and I'm probably going to say the biggest trick a couple of times. The biggest issue is quite, that quite simply what we're experiencing is, is deep uncertainty. We don't know where it's coming from. The Mexico tariffs were due to kick in on a Monday and on late on Friday, he pulled them and said, no, no, we've made a, a, a peace. We don't know what the next tweet and who it's going to put tariffs on. And that, that makes for global uncertainty, particularly with, with exporters and importers, and particularly in those exceedingly complex global supply chains. Uh, a comment from Charmaine, talk, you know, Tim Cook was the master of global supply chains. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, that's how, you know, understand, you know, off track, but let's touch on it quickly. What, Apple sells 70 odd million iPhones a quarter? And it is a staggeringly large number. And when you back end it all out and understand the complexity of getting everything at the right place produced, then moved to where somebody wants to buy that iPhone in the right number, the right uh, color, the right uh, uh, memory, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the complexity is humongous. And, and Tim Cook was absolutely the genius at it as are many others in this space, because it really is, we're in a just in time environment. You don't want, 100 iPhone XR 256 sitting in Santa and you want just enough for the next three weeks and then in two and a half weeks you get a new shipment arriving. So what is the impact? What is the impact perceived? What is the impact that we really see? So globally, global GDP, they reckon about $455 billion at risk. That is more than our economy. Uh, World Economic Forum is impact is expecting uh, by 2020 um, that the US would lose potentially 0.7% of, sorry, global will lose 0.7 GDP, US 0.4, China 0.9, and EU 0.8. Oddly enough, EU's just up there with China, and, and that's just because a lot of stuff that, that, that they're getting in, in terms of going through to them still hurts, and just the bilateral nature of products. A product sold in Europe might be manufactured in, China, in, 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 sorry, by, in, in, in the US with Chinese goods, and therefore has impact and the like. On the surface of it, those numbers are not scary. I'll be perfectly honest. And, and this is taking into account the new, the new proposed tariffs that, that President Trump is putting in. Those numbers are not shockingly scary. That said, it's also partly where we are right now, which is kind of top of cycle. We've kind of had, we've, we've had the, 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 the longest ever bull market in the US, second in terms of, of, of actual percentage move, longest in terms of days and months. Um, and, and global economies are looking stretched and some of the, the, the markets, the equities underneath them are looking stretched. And if we take 0.9 off China and takes them down to, let's be generous and call it five and a quarter, puts them under 6% for the first time since forever, take 0.7 off the US, it puts them middling quarter to low two points, quarter to low 2.2 or so. But that's using historic numbers and there is an expectation of a potential softening of those numbers going forward. Uh, EU. 0.8, and they don't have a lot of wiggle room. Yeah, you know, they, they just don't have a lot of wiggle room. And let's take South Africa. We're going to be lucky to do 1% this year. Take off 0.7, and uh, we're, we're at zero. So could this, could this tip some uh, economies around the world into recession? Absolutely. Could it tip some major economies into recession? Uh, thinking US, thinking EU, thinking China. Um, on its own, probably not. But with the bigger picture that we're seeing, it possibly could. It, it could get very ugly. And there's some data, and I'll show it in a second, that shows that things are already starting to tighten. And as I said, we don't have that second round coming through. There are some winners. South Korea, Vietnam, Taiwan, broadly Southeast Asia, as production moves outside China. So Foxconn has already said, you know what, we make the iPhone, we make it in China, but we actually have capacity, well, not spare capacity, but we could start making, I don't know, something else in China and move the manufacturer of those uh, iPhones to a country that isn't being uh, uh, tariffed. So there certainly is some pickup in, in, in the Southeast Asia as some economy, as some businesses, some production moves outside of China. Hence, we've seen China starting to reduce some tariffs between some of their neighbors uh, to try and take off some of that pain. Um, that said, is can it be done to the same standard? It has to be. Can the production be done at the same price? That becomes more complicated. And we've got to understand what China 
is no longer. China started as a, as a, as a, as a very low cost, low quality place. And they have, much like Japan has, they have upped it to the point where China is no longer massively cheap, but for the price, you get no better quality. And in fact, the quality is excellent at really good prices. Vietnam, on the other hand, is not. Vietnam's where, uh, where, where, where China was 30 years ago, where they produce, but they're using cheap, largely unskilled. Um, yeah, so quick question from Matthew on, on inflation. So inflation gets very interesting. And intuitively, as a base case, inflation will, will, be, will, be, will, will be going up, right? Goods are going to cost more. The question is if we still start seeing that quantitative easing. I'm going all the way back now to Bernanke in 2008 when he started his quantitative easing. And he said, you know what, the risk is inflation. Uh, but if we don't do this, then it's going to be significantly worse. Now, we still haven't seen that inflation coming in. The trick, and Matthew, it's what you allude to, is that if we start to see inflation pick up, there's not a lot of wiggle room to really fight inflation. And that therefore goes through to bonds. And if you look at the presentation I did last year about uh, when does the bear start, you basically watch the 10-year treasury. And when that starts sustainably above 3% and moving towards 4%, know that a recession is coming know that a market top is in place and that certainly is partly what we're going to start to see and that is in part a flight to safety the trick is of course which and 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 the issue becomes well complicated but mostly it's going to be american and if they're going in and buying american bonds on mass uh, that's actually going to push prices down a little bit further which again so it gets deeply uh uh, 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 contradictory in a sense. It should be inflationary, but it's going to possibly be good for bonds, and we just haven't seen inflation coming through at any point any well, in the in the in the global developed markets. But even in South Africa, you know, our inflation is stuck around four and a half five percent. And I know we all say not my inflation. Understand that Stats SA has a basket, as does everyone else. They use substitution. If you were buying bananas and the price of bananas went up, they assume that you switched to oranges because their price didn't go up. And, you know, banana, orange, right, it's all fruit. Uh, South America and some of the countries down there, certainly, for example, soya beans uh, was a huge issue. Uh, and that has basically moved to Brazil. Now, this has, to my sense, this has longer term implications in the quite simple process that what we're going to start to see is that this production or this demand that has moved to Brazil, well, why not, you know, when trade wars are over, why do you go back to China? You can just sort of stay with Brazil. Now, Brazil was already to a little bit picking up, not very much, but it has boomed and, and, and Brazil is loving it. China has absolutely collapsed. So what you start to see is production moving. And then the question is, does it ever go back to where it was? Some of it will, maybe much of it will. Uh, but certainly some of it will stay behind, and that is therefore lost to that particular economy. Emerging markets are going to be mixed. If I look at these economies here, Vietnam, Taiwan, uh, Brazil, Argentina, they're all emerging markets. Um, so there will be some winners, but there will be lots of losers. And the short answer to me is when the elephants fight, the grass suffers. And, and what I mean here is that Brazil might pick up in their soya production to, to China and Vietnam might pick up some production as well. But if we're seeing a general slowing down of global economies, yeah, they picked up a bit, but demand slackened and other products that they export, demand slackened there as well. So at the end of the day, truthfully, very, very few winners. And and I'm going to get to, to some specifics towards the end of the presentation. But, you know, when he was um, doing the campaigning, President Trump was saying trade wars are easy to win. Uh, they're not easy to win. They they basically just damage global economies um, because of that interconnectedness. You know, a trade war 100 years ago would have been a different game entirely because of the lack of global supply trains and the like. These days, everyone hurts. South Africa, do we have capacity for some steel? Hey, maybe a little bit. Uh, some food, I'm thinking maybe some chicken relief. Um, you know, maybe we can start selling some, exporting some chicken. Truthfully, 
we have imports in this country. We haven't got chicken to export. Uh, maybe some relief on the chicken side, just because we're getting less dumping into the economy. Not convinced about that either. Um, where the bigger driver of, of food is broadly going to be maize price and rainfall. That's going to remain. Gold, maybe, but you want the miners, and I'm going to come back to, to resources, commodities. Platinum, no. Petrol, so we were seeing oil edging lower um on, on on concerns around global gdp uh then of course iran the whole iran happened and the the, the boats being struck and all that sort of thing tankers and suddenly that gets complicated we are on track for a lower petrol price but oil is volatile and it's more going to be about the czar and quite simply in, in if we are seeing globally weakened economies, uh, money flowing out of emerging markets, that will weaken the czar uh, and oil doesn't matter. Petrol prices will go up. So there might be some longer term potential. You know, there might be some businesses who in the past were struggling to export into the US and now suddenly opportunities have opened. My sense is twofold. Um, they're going to be small and few and far between. So th this is not a case of as South Africans we can like, yeah, we can win this. Uh, I, 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 th I, th no, I, I think we are unlikely to come out as one of the big winners. And certainly at this point, there's nothing that is directly. So there was a potential opportunity for avocados, for example, tariffs on Mexico. Maybe that includes avocados, which is the major supplier into America for your guacamole and, and avo on toast for the hipsters. Um, and then maybe our avocado farmers could start doing a bit more exporting. But th that's great if you're an avocado farmer and that's great if you work or live or work near an avocado farm. But for our economy, we are frankly, avocados are not going to be what saves us. And there's not much that we are, are this, the citrus fruits at the same time, uh, some of those, but most of our citrus is already going into Europe uh, and none of it's coming from, from Mexico. So there's very little that we can say good for South Africa in the space in terms of what will happen. So what's been that China response so far? Um, very quiet. My big thing is is that I think they pay the, the long game. And Xi Jinping is now essentially, uh, what is he, emperor, premier, leader for life, whatever he calls him. And he's looking at this and saying 581 more days of Trump. Or if he wins in 2020, 2041 more days of Trump. And he's saying, you know what, 2041 days, I can wait. I can wait for the next leader of America who may or may not be more more engaged to talks. They're unlikely to be worse. So it might get better. Uh, and here's a thought, right? I bet he's also looking, and Xi Jinping and, and, and his Chinese peeps, I bet they're looking and thinking, yeah, but there was fiddling in the US election in 2016. Maybe we could fiddle in 2020. Maybe we could try and get someone who is more amenable to talks rather than tariffs and, and trade wars. Um, it just starts to get messy. The key point is that to understand China, I mean, people talk around ghost cities in China. Cities that have been built to to house hundreds of thousands of people, um, you know, and 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 eighty percent, ninety percent, there's nobody living there. And China's like, well, yeah, but you got to build it first. You build it, and then you find the people, and then you move them, and then everything will be fine. Infrastructure needs to be built before the demand comes, because if you wait for the demand, you're going to create bottlenecks. You know, things like Kocha, like Dubai and Durban, and stuff like that. Put the infrastructure in first. That's what China's been doing, and it requires a very long-term thinking. Whereas, I mean, Trump is quoted as, he was asked a question about 2025, and his answer was, I won't be president anymore. Uh, yeah, his thinking goes 2,041 days, no more, no less. Um, China, very much, I suspect, playing the longer game. And that longer game is going to be partly them engaging with with, with uh, other countries in, in the region in terms of, of um tariffs it could be washing something right so you build it in china but you ship it to vietnam and make it vietnamese when it goes into america uh, perhaps building up their own capacity so soya right okay why don't we make those fifty thousand people soya farmers now and start getting that working in in, in that space there um so it, it's much more complicated than just you know two leaders fighting in a sense they're fighting in different ways and styles and China's style is very much, you know, we have got time on our side.
So Chinese defenses, uh, they could weaken the, the currency. Uh, certainly there have been some hints at that starting to happen. This is Bloomberg data. I'm using uh, Bloomberg data and it comes up again in a moment. The reason why I'm doing it is because this is data that's been going for many years. So it's not data that they've suddenly rushed out to fit a trade war theory. This is stuff that they've been tracking forever and a day. And now we can start to see that impact. Um, China basically pegs their currency. That's what this chart here is illustrating to us um, and lets it move a little bit, but not really. But they could slowly shift that peg out. Now, there have been complaints by America to the World Trade Organization around currency manipulation on behalf of China. Um, and I, frankly, they do. They, they peg their currency. If you're pegging a currency, you're manipulating it because it's not trading free. But some weakening of the currency for China could certainly help them more than it's going to be helping the US. But that's going to, again, be a slow game. China doesn't want to have a big move in their currency. It's going to be very, very slow. There's been a lot of talk around rare earth metals uh, or minerals, as they called. Uh, truthfully, th th so they're the ones that sit right down at the bottom of the periodic table. They're not so rare. Much like iron ore, they occur naturally almost everywhere in the crust of planet Earth. The trick, again, much like iron ore, is you need a high enough concentration. Um, and mostly, these rare earth, rare earth minerals are, are, are byproducts from other mining. Now, China controls 90% of world supply, but in the short term, concerns that they would say, well, then you can't have our rare earths. Now, again, it comes back to China playing the long game. What you know, they've put some tariffs on and they've come in at 10% and they're there, but they're not going full blast at this process. They, you know, could they say no more rare earths? They could. Two things. Firstly, that would be an immediate shock to the global economy, and that would hurt China, and they don't want that either. Uh, but secondly, uh, they can round trip it, so they could export rare earths via Japan, uh, Taiwan, uh, Vietnam, and so the list goes on. And thirdly, there are other areas of the world where we can find the concentration high enough, and in three to five years, China's dominance of rare earths will be significantly weakened. And that last point is happening. Longer term, we're seeing new production come in. It's going to be three, five, ten years. But when we come back in 2029 and we look at this, uh, China won't be at 90% of, of, of world supply. And truthfully, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, you know, Any country having 90% of anything that, that the world needs is not a good thing. What about T-bills? U.S. Treasury bills starting to sell off that. China is the largest holder. This is 2018. The numbers have changed. I'll touch on that in a second. So China's 1.13. Japan's just over a trillion. Brazil at 313 billion. I got to say, Brazil surprised me. When I was, I, I would have. I mean, if, if if you'd asked me to list the top 20, I wouldn't have put Brazil in there. Brazil coming in at three, and Ireland coming in at four. That surprised me too. Um, what we are seeing, so another theory is, well, China could just uh, sell T-bills and crash it, crash the market. They could, but again, that's going to hurt them. They're taking a longer view. Trump's gone in 2041 days uh, if he wins in 2020. Um, what we are seeing is that they are slightly lightening. They're down to 1.1. So they've sold a little bit in the in, in, in the first half of, of this year. Uh, the, the, the peak for, for foreign government holding of T-bills was uh, April of this year. And it has been edging down a little bit. But you've got to be very careful to make this your battlefield. I mean, talk about when the elephants fight, the grass suffers. When the two largest economies, if they go full ball, uh, uh, you know, fight against each other, uh, it's not just the, the, the grass that suffers. It, they will suffer immeasurable and long-term harm at the same time. And partly, I think, this is what President Trump is betting on, right? He's betting that China aren't going to come back to him with the same level of aggression that he's hitting them. Um, and so far, that is most definitely playing out. U.S. debt in total, 22 trillion. So when you look at those numbers, uh, call it 1.1 uh, trillion for China, it's 5%. It, 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 it's not insignificant, but it's just 5% uh, of, of, of their total debt that sits in America. And this was for beginning of the year. I think it was the end of Jan number when they went past $22 trillion in debt. Uh, question coming through from Charmaine again. Uh, isn't $22 trillion debt a problem? Charmaine, yes, a significant problem. Uh, a topic of its own. Quite simply, it has to be repaid and it can't be. 
because the only way you repay that is to start aggressively uh, uh, spending less than you receive, which means taxes up, spending down, combination of both not going to happen anytime soon. That is That, that number is a scary number. What about Huawei? So banned the the uh, Huawei has been banned from purchasing goods from U.S. companies um, and for national security reasons initially. I'll come to that in a moment. Uh, Huawei is one of the second largest cell phone manufacturer in the world after Samsung. Uh, they make what I think is easily the best phone in the world, which is the uh, Mate Pro P20. Uh, 30. The 20 was good. The 30 is better. I don't own either. Uh, but I have played with them. Um, the big issue is 5G, which is obviously the, the new iteration from 4G, which is high speed and all of that sort of thing. And they make the world's 5G equipment and, and, and routers. Now, Ericsson and Nokia are the only other two tech giants with 5G. All the other companies that existed, say, 20 years ago, have just fallen by the wayside. And importantly, this is not Nokia, the Nokia phone. That all gets messy. Uh, Nokia is sort of a brand more than anything else. They have at times made rubber boots and cell phones, and now they do 5G equipment. So certainly Ericsson and Nokia stand to gain from this in the sense that uh, if you're not buying... <coughs> Excuse me, if you're not buying your 5G equipment from Huawei because you're not allowed to, well, then you need it and you're probably going to Ericsson and Nokia. The question is, is it a national security issue or is it a bargaining tool? Because when it first came out, Trump was very clear that this was a national security issue. He's done it before with ZTE. Uh, was it beginning of last year where he basically crippled the company and then undid it? Um, and his concern is that if, if a Chinese company is able, basically has laid the network for 5G. What happens one day when the Chinese government comes knocking on their shoulder and says, hey, we want to have a quick listen? And we have precedent for this. The NSA and the US has done it. We know this because of the Snowden re re revelation. So whilst no uh, uh, Huawei equipment has been found to have bugs or backdoors or anything, a lot of it is software. A lot of it can be updated remotely. Could China do this? Yes, there has been no evidence, but China could one day just spy on every 5G network. Would they want to? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. So is it a national security issue? Well, maybe. But then we're going to Ericsson and Nokia, and then basically some other co companies have this potential power. But then Trump tweeted around how they could be part of the trade tariff negotiations. And that confused the heck out of me because this is a national security. Was it a bargaining tool? Because if it's national security, how it can't be part of the bargaining tool because we're talking national, heck, we're talking global cyber security. So at, at this point, it frankly remains unclear. They are, they've had a 90-day stay, which runs through into August. Um, and if it remains in force, Ericsson and Nokia will be the two big winners in the 5G space. Their tech's not as good, but if you can't get the Huawei tech, then you've basically got to get the Ericsson and Nokia tech. Then, of course, there's the G20 summit meeting in Japan uh, next week. Now... What Trump has said thus far is that uh, if, if uh, uh, President uh, Xi Jinping uh, of China doesn't talk to him, then, then, then things are going to get really, really ugly. But this is an opportunity for them to have a face-to-face. -face. This is an opportunity for them to have a discussion on the sidelines of the G20, and hopefully we can get something that comes out of that. There is certainly an expectation. Um, no, absolutely. Uh, David says 5G is not just spying, upsets, disruption of communication. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it, it. if we think about it intuitively, and I think certainly I never had thought about it before, but, you know, so way back, 20 odd years ago, Cisco basically ran the Internet. Every router on the Internet was basically a Cisco. Um, and that, that gave, you know, it, it, it went fine, but it meant that if there was, maybe there was simply a technical problem with Cisco, maybe there wasn't, they weren't able to produce fast enough or quality enough, or maybe they decided to spy on everyone. Although those days there was less software updates, they were pretty much hardwired. But you do, I mean, do you really want any one corporation slash economy slash country in charge of your data networks? The short answer is no. The long answer is I don't know what we do about it. Um, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. Anyway, back to G20. So hopefully there will be, to my mind, this G20 meeting is of 
critical importance. This is where Trump and uh, uh, Xi Jinping can sit down and can iron out some sort of agreement. And I think that China is probably quite happy to give some concessions to Trump based on 2041 days, based on the long-term view, and based on the view that trade tariffs are bad for economies locally and globally, and that someone in that negotiation needs to be the bigger person and it's not going to be Trump. So we, my hope is that something comes out of Japan. But let's be real, it might not, in which case this is where we are sitting right now with terrible trade wars. And what comes out of Japan is important. And secondly, will it be stuck to? Or will another tweet from the White House wake us up early one morning with you know, terrifying news? Short answer, time will tell. Uh, G20 next week, so quite close. So it's ugly and it's starting to hurt. So here's some Bloomberg data. And again, I've used this particular data from Bloomberg because it is data that they have been, this is something that I have been watching on Bloomberg for years and years and years and years. So it's not, they've suddenly manufactured data to try and make things look, you know, to try and fit a story into the trade wars. This is something which commonly has been watched. It also means that this could be, instead of trade wars, it could also in part just be global slowdown. There's the Canadian economist who last week said that the world is already in recession. The data will catch up in a bit. Um, but what we're certainly seeing from these data is, and if you look at the top one up at the above, where is the line? Well, there's only one that is, not, that is, that is above average. The others are in the average zone, but below zero, and then some are into the minus one zone. So what we are most definitely seeing is this is starting to hurt. Um, and you know, is the pain massive at this moment? No, it's not. It, it absolutely isn't. We're in the average zone. We're on the wrong side of the average zone, and we don't have any green, but uh, we, we're in that average zone. We're doing okay in that sense there. And this is looking at things like LA Cargo, which is 40% of the world's containers. Singapore, second busiest port by volume. Uh, North Asia Transit, which goes through Hong Kong. Uh, Baltic Dry Index, we can debate that one's usefulness, but it's in the list, so I use it. Um, German Expectations is the strongest economy in Europe, has been edging down this year. Uh, U.S. new exports, again, this is an ISM, uh, of, and it's an outlook from, from 300 managers across industries looking negative. China, new exports, no surprise, looking very ugly. And Singapore, uh, because Singapore is a further conduit that China can use, not looking at this point, picking up the slack. What this data tells us, what we saw earlier with GDP and the other bits we've seen is what might happen in time. What this data tells us is unequivocally is that it is tough out there. Now, is this trade wars? Is this just a good old-fashioned, we've had a long, hard run and nothing goes up forever in a day? Uh, short answer, don't know. But my argument would be that certainly I think there, there has to be some trade war in here. It might not be all trade war but there's no chance it is zero trade war. Certainly some of this bleak looking data is the trade war story. So as investors, where do we hide? Cash, that's our new five rand coin made by Lady Scully, be arriving in August, can't wait. So my problem with cash is multifold. Firstly, I've got to generate it. So there's always cash coming into the portfolio, right? You're depositing money, you're receiving dividends. I'm talking here about selling out of current positions and building a cash position to buy at the bottom. And there are two tricks. What if they make peace at the G20 next week and there's no global recession and we're off to the races and we go up another 50% and you had moved into cash and you got left way, way behind? What if that there's no peace and it just gets worse and that data I was showing you is absolutely ugly? And now you've got to make that call of, well, when do I get back in? It's just too much timing around cash, notwithstanding that there are costs of transaction, notwithstanding there are potential CGT uh, uh, implications and tax and the like. I, I, I'm, so what I do to manage a situation and what I'm doing here, although I haven't started yet because I don't want to front run myself and you know, I'm telling you what I'm going to be buying. I'm not going to buy it and then go tell you all to go buy it after me. We can all buy it at the same time. Um, what I'm starting to do is money that comes into my portfolio via discretionary monthly deposits and that sort of thing and dividends, etc. I'm softening that to what I consider to be more resilient. So I always keep my cash levels low. 
So the first big picture is avoid tech stocks. And there are two giant reasons for it. And this is the first giant reason. Uh, US equity revenue exposure to China is 14.2%, which means on a straight line trade war scenario, for example, Apple, equity, Apple revenue drops 14.2%. Now, Apple's got more cash on their balance sheet than South Africa has cash, debt. Does, I, you, you get the point. I mean, Apple can kind of swallow it, but it's going to squeeze margins. It's going to make it less enticing. Chinese equity revenue is 9%. Information tech, IT, is without a shadow of a doubt the biggie up there. And that's where the most pain is going to be felt if these trade wars go completely crazy. Yes, we can hack some of it. Yes, not all uh, Apple products are sold in America. For example, iPhones are being sold in South Africa. An iPhone coming from China to South Africa is not subject to any U.S. tariff. Uh, an iPhone made in, 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 in China could perhaps be made in Korea instead, South Korea, and shipped to America free of it. But can they get the same prices from Korea, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the straight line number. And the ultimate number is probably less bad. But that's if we halve it, 7% is a horror number. And I think halving is probably about fair. That's probably our best case scenario if we halve these numbers. And I think worst case is probably a little bit lower than what we've got right now at the same time. Here's the second reason we need to avoid tech. The run of the last decade plus has been driven by tech stocks. From December 07 to Jan 19, the, the, the annualized return of the NASDAQ total return has been 13%. The S&P 500 total return has been 8%. The, SMP, the NASDAQ has, over that period, done more than double what S&P has. And if we look down at the bottom down here, we see that NASDAQ is no, supply, no surprise, 53% uh, telecommunications, whereas S&P is only 21%. Consumer services includes Amazon. Amazon fits into consumer services. Uh, so if we throw a slice of that in there, then we see NASDAQ at over 60%, uh, whereas we see S&P approaching maybe 25%. So the tech has had the massive hard run, and the tech is, in the, and we see this in the in the Nasdaq versus the S and P. And tech is where the real pain is going to be felt. So they are at elevated levels, and suddenly their profits might come under pressure. And this is a this to me. I mean, if if there's one big takeaway from this, is be scared of tech stocks going forward. Now, I don't have any massive weight to tech. I have some S and P 500, uh, but I trade those. Most of my um, offshore is in the Ashburton 1200, which has only got about 16 or 17 percent tech. So I've got a lot, but I haven't got 60 percent. And there will be some pain there, but it's not going to be as severe. What I'm focusing on is consumer staples. Now, there's still some pain here, but let's take the same scenario. We halve that consumer staple number. We get down to, say, 2.5 is best case scenario. Worst case, 4.5, maybe 5%. Costs on consumer staples will potentially rise in places as input costs work their way through, but demand remains stable. And the beauty, consumer staples are toothpaste. Yeah, we're still going to brush our teeth. There's a recession outside. You don't like, oh, it's tough out there not brushing my teeth today. I, I mean, maybe people do and I just work from home and haven't noticed. The point being is that is that there's still the consumer staples are your boring things, the everyday sort of things that are going to remain. Some of them utilities, obviously, but that's hard to access. Uh, financials, yes. Insurance, yes. Uh, real estate, sure. Uh, materials, obviously, big, big hit. Uh, energy and industrials, not so much. And it's the big one, the outlier is, is Infotech up there, IT. So where do we hide? The core shares global dividend aristocrat. The local South African issued ETF tracking the global div dividend aristocrat ETF. Now, why does this work? Because dividends are used as a quality metric. This is not about the size of the dividend they pay. This is about quality. So to be included in this in this ETF for, as an American company, you need 25 years of continuous dividend payments. So very light on tech because most of these stocks didn't exist. Most of these tech stocks didn't exist 25 years ago, never mind be listed. So if we look here, um, what we see is quite simply that, yeah, there's some, there's some t uh, 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 tech in here. Uh, and now I'm trying to find it. There it is. Their information technology is 
It's practically nothing. What have we got? We've got consumer staples, nice big uh, uh, number for us. Industrials are going to hurt a bit. Materials are going to hurt a bit. Real estate utilities, hardly hurt at all. Financials, doing great. Healthcare, I think they can survive. What you've got in this ETF, still huge exposure to the US at 54%, which is typical for your global products. Um, what we're seeing, though, is a significant down weighting in IT. So, if things go horribly pear-shaped, I'm not saying that this ETF is not going to fall off the edge of the world. What, I, what I'm saying is that this ETF is going to have a less tough time of it. It will pull back less. It will recover quicker. It will have less of a drawdown. In other words, what we're kind of doing is hedging our bet, right? If we find ourselves in global trade wars, this ETF has been broadly tracking the S&P 500 um, and lagging the NASDAQ. If everything carries on, okay, well, we're going to do okay. We're going to make money out of this. And if things get terribly bad going forward, well, then we're at least in the safest corner of the house. And that was, you know, it goes back to my fairly earlier point. I'm taking the assumption that just selling everything and going into cash is a terrible idea. So taking that as a given, where do we hide? And this is one of the places that we can be hiding. Commodities, I see a question here, a point here from Matthew. Uh, not a gold bull, but divergence of oil and gold price indicating trouble to come. Um, yeah, so I mean, gold is moving for the first time in forever. And I think you're right. If we look at oil, uh, oil spikes very quickly on news. You know, a tanker gets a satellite in the Gulf of Oman and boom, oil spikes. Uh, uh, Trump says it wasn't whatever and oil's back down, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas gold is much more the longer thing. So gold is gold. Currently, it's moving on Iranian oil fears. Um, but I think it's also moving, to your point, Matthew, I think it is moving on some concerns. I think it is moving on, on worries about what's going forward. Now, gold as a hedge in a perfect world, it doesn't work. Uh, so let, let's step that back. Gold as an investment is terrible, no compound, no interest, cost to carry, terrible investment case. Gold as a hedge works until stuff goes real pear shaped. And I give you as an example 0809. In 2008, gold went down. Why? Because when global markets are in crisis mode, uh, there's so much leverage in this, i.e., things being purchased with debt that, that investors, if for want of a better phrase, need to realize cash. And they don't want to sell their S&P holding when it's down 50%, but hey, gold isn't down. So they sell their gold holding and by proxy push it down. So ultimately, the, 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 the lack of we, we can find uncorrelated assets. And in normal times, uncorrelated assets work. But what 08, 09 taught us is that when times are not normal, everything is correlated. And in 08, 09, everything went down. I mean, just everything went down. So if you want to be ready, go for it, uh, a well-leveraged gold miner, your safer bet is just to park some gold in a portfolio, buy some new gold or some Kruger coins or something like that um, if you want some gold in there. But the gold point is that at, at some point you're going to have to take your profit and run for the hills. Broadly, commodities with GDP, Chinese GDP under pressure, less commodity demand. I'm worried about uh, the iron ore prices. I'm worried about less so platinum and palladium, but certainly I'm worried about iron ore. I'm worried about coal prices. All of those sort of prices will start to hurt. So that was where to for the investors, where to for the traders. For the traders, it's the same. It always is. Traders don't care about the trade wars. Traders stick to your strategy and obey your stops. Just that simple. Strategy and stops, nothing else matters. And if markets are going down, you want to be short. And if markets are going up, you want to be long. And if you can't decide which way they're going, sit on the sides and have a cup of coffee. So in closing, the first thing to realize is that this happens slowly, slowly. New cycles and markets get distracted. We get distracted by the fact that uh, Trump has decided not to impose tariffs on on Mexico, and suddenly everything's great. And then he's going to we're going to get a Fed rate cut, which might happen as early as tomorrow, and everything's lovely again. And that's fine. Markets are looking the next, you know, they're looking around the next corner. That bigger picture is trade wars equals global economic pain, not helped by to a large degree, overstretched markets in the US, less so in Europe and the rest of the world, South Africa, but overstretched in particular IT markets. Those tech markets are, stre are massively stretched and it's not helped. If we were doing this in 20, 
14, 15, it would be a, it would be less uh, potential pain coming through. But at this point where we stand right now, there is real potential pain. That meeting which is Friday next week uh, with Trump and Xi at the G20 summit. To my mind, if we don't get trade peace at that, then then expect the global economic pain coming. And as I say, it's coupled by the fact that we've got those stretched valuations. In of itself, it's bad, but it's a whole bunch together. Um, this is the trick is this is a top of a cycle event and what i mean by that is that this isn't happening in 2014 this is happening at the top so we were already i was already looking at markets and thinking you know ish gently gently these markets are are, are looking stretched i'll stay with them but you know you're not going to get another 100 percent out of the s p from this point so tech commodities extra careful I'm not selling anything. I'm already light on cash. I'm using free, sorry, I'm light on tech. I'm using my free cash to go buy that low div ETF. Uh, someone's asking to have a look at it. I'll show you the chart in a second. Um, and if you, if you, if you're inclined, go buy yourself some, 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 try some hedging with some gold. Be careful with the gold. Um, because at some point, if things get really ugly, the gold will get strongly sold off at the same time. Uh, glow div in of itself. I made the throwaway comment that it broadly tracks the S&P, and it pretty much has to a fair degree. Uh, so we don't have as much history with it because it's relatively new. Massive run-up until the last quarter of last year, the sell-off which we saw, and then the run-up. What you notice is missing here is that that second leg down which we saw uh, just in what? It was uh, May. Is that that sell-off in May, we didn't see it here. And now partly we are helped by currency in the South African scenario, but partly the sell-off, even if we remove the currency impact, the sell-off was less bad. Uh, EJ, you're asking about real estate. Uh, local real estate is struggling. I am buying property ETFs in my tax-free account, uh, but real estate in South Africa is, is finding it really, really tough. Their problem is, is they're not getting new uh, uh, leases through at good rates, and they're losing customers. But what we are losing tenants. What we are seeing in South African retail uh, REITs is the classic buy signals. One is you buy at or below net asset value. Now, those net asset values are at risk of falling, but still you're not paying a 30 or 40% premium as you were three, four years ago. And you want to buy when the yield is above the 10-year bond. Our 10-year bond is about eight. The yield is about nine. I'm not saying they won't go down further, but at this point, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, property locally is attractive in a medium-term scenario. This will, this will hurt. Global trade wars are going to cause uh, uh, markets to, to, to suffer, economies to suffer, and real estate will fall into that. Uh, David, does my no tech also extend to NASPAS? Great question. Because as a South African, you are, you are well exposed to NASPAS. If you've got a, a, a Satrix 40, 20 plus percent is NASPAS. If you've got a, a, a Reg 28 retirement fund, probably not 20, but probably a released sort of 7 to 8 to 9 percent. And short answer, yes, but no. And I know that's a really bad answer, but, but here's why. Because this is China tech. Now, is China going to get hurt in this environment, in this global slowdown? Of course it is. But because China's China and they've got the level of control, a command economy is the fancy phrase I heard over the weekend, they can do things which simply can't be done in America. They can instruct their banks to loan money. They can instruct their telcos, their, their, their IT companies to not sell games to, to kids. They can instruct things which simply can't happen in America. So I do think Tencent will hurt, uh, but I think significantly less so than the Amazons and the Apples of the world. And if we go back to this slide here, we can see the significant difference of 14 and change versus 9 for Chinese equities. So a lot less exposure in that sense. Because remember, Tencent is mostly selling into China. Um, of course, they also own Epic Games, et cetera, et cetera. So not completely immune. The other point around Tencent is I think that this Amazon deal, which will, sorry, Amazon, Amsterdam deal, which will happen in July, should be a value unlock and could see easy 10, 15, maybe as much as 20% added to NASPAS if it works as great. Uh, Robert, same sort of question. Uh, yeah, so I mean, they, they move. So, so Robert, I'm not sure I'm getting you 100%, but what about moving into maybe looking for more EU exposure? The problem with the EU is that their economy is still so, so fragile and their interest rates are 
you know, at zero to negative. They're still doing quantitative easing. The EU is just not strong enough to handle the shock that will come. Um, America, I think, will handle it better. I think just because of the size and the strength of the economy, I think uh, uh, China will handle it better because of their command economy. Europe remains fragile. Um, and the reason is they were so late to the party. Uh, yeah, it, it, absolutely. So NASPAS is, uh, David, that, that discounted entry into, into Tencent. At this point, that discount is around 40%. I haven't looked at the exact numbers recently. It's around 40% and then discounting everything else NASPAS owns to zero, remembering, of course, they've spun off multi-choice. The trick being is that we, you know, and a, part of the reason I think we get that discount is that asset managers simply can't buy NASPAS to its weighting. You know, holding 20% of any stock in a fund or, or, or something like that, it's in breach of Reg 28. Reg 28, I think, caps out you can't have more than 10. Um, so simply, asset managers in South Africa are unable to buy NASPAS to the size at which they should be, which is broadly around that 20%. Now, what you would normally do as a fund manager is you check your benchmark, you see NASPAS at 20%, and you make a call. Do you want to be overweight, on weight, or underweight NASPAS? Um, the difference is that in our current market, you can't do the overweight position. All you could, the only call you can make on NASPAS is how underweight relative to the index do you want to be, which means a lot less money going into it, which means why I think the Amsterdam deal is going to work and will unlock value because then some foreigners can start picking up and then we can see a whole new story there and I think that will help in that sense. Ladies and gents, that's me for now and I am almost spot on one hour, which was the time... Uh, allocated. Robert, you've got me an outlier. Let me click on that. I love outliers. Uh, Facebook's virtual currency. Yeah. I mean, so, so what Facebook is doing is they're creating what they call it a crypto, but Robert, to your point, it's a virtual currency. What they're really doing is they're looking for remittance, right? The remittance of people moving money, you know, living in Joburg, but moving it back to Zimbabwe, living in New York, but moving it back to Bangalore, India, is a humongous market, and the current financial services people are ripping it off. Uh, Zuckerberg and Facebook could have done it in a billion different ways. Why they want to have their own their own uh, virtual currency, I suppose to remove the fact that it's a dollar or a dirham or whatever the case may be, they're going to make a truckload out of it. I hate the idea. I don't like Facebook, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But man, they're going to make an absolute killing out of it in the process. Uh, and someone says, what about Bitcoin? I, I mean, Bitcoin's tricky. I mean, I just... Bitcoin just moves and stuff. So uh, I speak to Petri Raiden, he's a trader Petri on Twitter. He will tell you that the next halving is coming and therefore Bitcoin is running. Uh, I'm not confident enough on Bitcoin to make any suggestions uh, either way. It was obviously a bubble at 20,000 um, at this point. I have my two. As soon as I can sell my two Bitcoins for the enough money to fly me to space, I'm selling and I'm off to space. Ladies and gents, we'll park it there. Everyone, appreciate your time. Cheers all.